Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every week on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. If you are a painter or artist who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community, you will be inspired to create, and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community. But make sure you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. Vaughn Sumner is my guest this week. Vaughn is something of a portrait painter, just not in the traditional sense. His images may come from his observation, but they're filtered through his mind's eye. Los Angeles arts writer and critic Peter Frank describes Vaughn as a figure painter of uncommon wit and sensitivity. And I think that sums up Vaughn's work best without putting a label on it. In this episode, Vaughn talks about growing up in Palo Alto, California, where he was exposed to a lot of art, specifically Bay Area figurative artists. His second home was the back room of his father's framing studio. But it was one particular museum exposition on a family trip to France that sort of sealed the deal. After seeing that, he knew he would be a painter. Vaughn also talks about his decision to study at UC Davis and his experiences there with the artist Wayne Thiebaud. If it was hard for Vaughn to describe what it was like without becoming hyperbolic, it was just as hard for me to not make this the what did Wayne say episode. So of course, we talk about painting and we talk about that eternal gap between our vision and what comes out on the canvas. What is that? And can we shorten the gap? So this is a fantastic interview. I hope you enjoy it. Here is Vaughn Sumner. Vaughn, thank you so much for being a part of the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm really excited to get to talk to you. I'm happy to be here. Tell me a little bit about when you started out as an artist. What were some of the painters that maybe you looked at when you were younger and thought, I want to try that. I want to do this. I was lucky enough to be exposed to a lot of art and painting as a kid because my dad owned his own picture framing shop and it was sort of my home away from home. I grew up in the back of that shop, you know? Oh, how fun. So there was a lot of things that I was exposed to. Of course, Bay Area figurative because I grew up in, this is in Palo Alto. Those people were still a big part of that area even in the 80s and 90s, you know, and my dad was friends with people like Nathan Oliveira and Frank Lobdell. They were teaching at Stanford and local people. So nice. Those things were in the water. But I I have to say it's a it's a funny, it's kind of a funny reference to do it. But my parents took me to England when I was 10 or 11. And I think it was on the way home. You know, my memory is a little bit fuzzy on it, but I believe on the way home, we went through France. And while we were in France, we they took me to a Monet water lily show. Oh, wow. Of all things. And I knew, I knew it changed my life. I knew standing in that show, that's what I want to do. It was very clear. Wow. And it was something about seeing that paint up close and seeing the color and the brush marks. It was just, uh, I was always artistic, but it was seeing that, that I knew specifically like what kind of thing I wanted to do. Painting. Right. There it is. (laughs) Right. Not just any kind of art, not just card, you know, like I think kids when Mm -hmm. you're younger, like I wouldn't, it's the things that you see most often. So I wanted to be a children's book illustrator because that's what I was looking at. Totally. Yeah. And I loved all that. And I spent, you know, like a lot of us, I spent my childhood copying cartoons and comics. Yep. And just because those were the drawings you saw, right? Yeah. Yeah. The things that you're exposed to every day. I remember, yeah, I remember my mom gave me, I still have it. It's this gigantic, I mean, huge (laughs) coffee table book of French Impressionist painters. And I remember just like, that was my first exposure, I think, to Monet and and those painters and just being yeah. like, you know, good and bad, you know, like there's some in there that I still don't like, and I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, it was the great thing about seeing this at that age, it hadn't been ruined for me yet by 
you know, calendars and sort of the magnets and <laughs> coffee mugs and kitsch. It was truly seeing it with fresh eyes, just as, you know, the wonder of a kid seeing these enormous paintings. And they're they're big paintings anyway, but as a kid it just seems like Yeah. They are endless. There's no top or bottom or sides. And it's just color and brush marks. And of course, you walk back and you see this image come into view. It, was, it blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what did you do then? Did you start taking art classes or did you just double down on what you were already doing? It's really funny. I Well, I had already been doing art classes and stuff. I mean, I was I was into it. But that that show, I, as soon as we got home, I spent the rest of that summer trying to be an impressionist. (laughs) (laughs) See if you can imagine like this 11 year old boy Uh with, um, and I didn't have oil paints. I had, uh, that was expensive. I had oil pastels. Yep. And I got the biggest sheets of paper that I could. And I spent that whole summer drawing outside from, you know, the garden. and Wow, really? I was really trying to be. Weeping willow trees, you know? Yeah. Going to the park. Really, I really did that. And they were horrible. And I remember just being so discouraged, not discouraged. It was very noticeable to me that my drawings were nowhere near as good as those paintings I saw. (laughs) And I was really curious about why, you know? Why couldn't you just do what you had in your head? Why wouldn't it look that good? And it was really... You know, I caught the bug. I, it, it was a real question for me. I think that gap or whatever you want to call it, I'm so fascinated by that also, because like there's, I think at first it sort of keeps you going in the sense that you get excited and you want to learn more and, and all that, but it's, it's frustrating. And then at a yeah. certain point, like there's always this gap, I think, between your vision your creative vision, what's in your head and what actually comes out on the canvas. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And how we deal with that gap, I think, is a large part of, I don't want to say whether or not you make it as an artist, but whether you Mm -hmm. keep going, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a pitfall in getting too attached to the images in our head and not realizing that those aren't anything Really, until there's until there's paint on a canvas or whatever you're making, right? It's kind of imaginary. And you keep chasing those things in your head. But I think you'll get discouraged if you if you don't commit to just dealing with what's actually there. Yeah, that's really that's a really interesting take on it. I think I've sort of come to this conclusion that that gap is always gonna be there. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I, I can sort so. of keep chasing trying to make that gap smaller while yeah. recognizing that it's never going to go away. But your take on it is really interesting. I like that, that <laughs> it's a very subtle difference. I agree with what you're saying though. I guess what it is, is I've, I see them as two different things and yes, you try to get them to come together, but I've learned to almost simultaneously trust and mistrust my, all the images flooding through my head, you know? Ooh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I use them as motivation I and I try to get them, but there's also a little, I have to prioritize the things that actually happen on the painting and realize that that's all anyone's ever going to see. They're not going to see the little things that I thought I saw in my head, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much better they were. <laughs> Those brilliant insights that you had. <laughs> yeah, that's... One of the most beautiful and frustrating things about being a painter, I remember when I finally came to that realization that that gap or that thing would always be there, I was pissed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I was pissed. And then I got over it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a stage. I think it's something that we go through and we go, and it's not that you ever let go of them, because I think part of that that chase is what sustains us, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that you have to have this, you know, Degas said something about this, this idea of you have to have, I'll misquote him a little bit, I'm sure. You have to have a really high conception of what it is that you're going to do someday, not what you're doing now, but what you might get to someday. And that, that, is sort of the sustaining, 
you know, the North Star. Yeah. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, I thought that if I worked hard enough in, you know, 40, 50 years <laughs> that I would mm-hmm. I would get over that. And then painting would just be that mythical thing that we, you know, that some people think that it is that you waltz into your studio and these masterpieces just come out of you like left yeah, and yeah, right. Yeah. And it's just like birds are singing and the sun shining and all this yeah. stuff. And yeah, I was reading this biography. I can't remember who who it was, but you know, definitely it is like 80, 90 year old self saying like, it's still a struggle every single day. And I'm like, that's you right. got to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. So that summer that I spent trying to be a French impressionist, <laughs> <laughs> it introduced that to me immediately, that distance between what I thought I was going to do <laughs> and then what I did and how hard it was and how long it took and how much there was to learn, you know? Yeah. But it, I wasn't discouraged. I was sure, you know, I was convinced, like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just going to have to draw that much more, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, well, fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it that fascinates you about painting? What is it that, like, when I talk about my own gap, there might be specific things that that fascinate me that, you know, we kind of talked about just playing with colors and what if I do this and what if I do that? What are the things that just get you kind of salivating about painting or is there anything that does that? It's well, yeah, but those things are hard to talk about, you know, they're hard to put into words. The things that get me salivating are often seeing other paintings. I think that's a big primary reason for people painting is they saw, they saw one, you know, it's like somebody made those cave paintings and the whole thing was set in motion from then. Yeah. You know, some yeah. other person saw those and thought, wow, I want to do that, you know? Yeah. And then it's just this domino effect through history <laughs> of people seeing paintings and getting that little electricity and go, I need to do that. Right. So, I mean, that's part of it. But when you say what fascinates you about it, that's a really hard one to put into words. But, you know, painting is, to me, I, I have to think of it as like a question. My relationship any to, anyway is this thing of, I know I want to do this. I know I need to do this. And then almost immediately, there's a little voice that's like, well, what is this, though? What is it? What is painting? <laughs> and that fascinates me endlessly. You mm-hmm. Know? Mm-hmm. Is it color? Is it mark? Is it touch? Is it imagery? Is it a picture? Is it not a picture? Is it an experience or is it a yeah. pro- is it a the thing that comes out at the end? Yeah, uh-huh. And I don't mean objectively. I mean very subjectively. What is it for me? Right. Like I would never pretend to be answering what painting is for everybody. <laughs> That's the yeah, no. It's too hard. It's a really personal question. It's every mark and every painting is a question. Do I mean this? Is this it? You know, is this the right way? Yeah, I every now and again I go to Italy and I study with Israel Hirschberg and mm-hmm. one of the things that really changed the way that I paint was actually a comment he made about another person's painting. This person was just extremely skilled at at painting. Like, you know, he could paint trash thrown out on the ground and make it look just amazing. Yeah. And what Israel said to him is you're making statements, you're not asking questions. You're saying mm. this is what I see and you should be asking is this what I see? Mm-hmm. Constantly and over and over again and never allowing yourself to actually answer that question, which mm-hmm. is really really hard. You know, it's that same thing of just constantly remaining curious as opposed to maybe starting a painting or getting halfway through it and deciding that this is what it is. Yeah. And then you finish the painting because you've made a decision halfway through and you just execute that decision you made at that point, which is so simple. (laughs) And it's so hard to keep asking yourself, is this it? Is this it? Yeah. Is this what I'm seeing? Is this what I envision? Is this, you know, whether or not you're an observational painter, is this what I see? Or is this, is this the experience that I want to create? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, that for me is, you know, one of the really driving forces and it's there whether I want it to be or not. 
I think we've all experienced the urge to just have an answer. <laughs> it, would, it seems so much easier, right? <laughs> yeah. Just tell me. Just, yeah. You know what I mean? Just tell, here, do this and that'll be the right thing. And so I, I, I do wish that, but it's just, it's just the way that I seem to be and also the artists that I tend to have gravitated toward, both as teachers and as just historical painters that I love. They're often that kind of of kind of restless and questioning, curious thing. And it's one of the things I look for when I'm looking at art, contemporary art, is if I recognize someone searching like that or whatever that spirit is. That's what I that's what I really respond to. That's what makes me excited and sympathetic, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you tell me so I know you, after you made this, after that summer of Monet, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that was a period in your life. It is now. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then you went on and you studied at, at UC Davis. And can you tell me a little bit about some of the, I guess, moments in that, I want to call it the learning period, you know, like when you go, you decide you're going to be an artist and then you start developing your skills and you go through college and supposedly, when you graduate, you're supposed to just take over the world, I guess. I don't know what's supposed to happen. But there's this sort of almost idea that when you finish your art degree, you've learned what you need to know, and now you need to go do it. But in reality is, you're constantly learning. Yeah, I never had that illusion. You were a lucky one, then. Well, I, I was. I was really lucky. And part of it was going to UC Davis. And it was almost, it was a weird decision for someone coming from where I came from in a way. Why? So I grew up in Palo Alto in a place that it's become much more this way since I left there. When I was there, there was some sense of the kind of Bay Area, San Francisco counterculture was a little bit left around, but it was transitioning. Mm hmm. <laughs> into what became a extremely kind of competitive and almost prep school atmosphere now. Mm. At Stanford, you mean? Yeah. And the high school that I went to and, the, you know, I went to Stanford Middle School and then Palo Alto High School. And there were I was kind of outside of this because my parents were sort of ex hippies and I was into art and stuff. But the culture around me was very competitive. And almost all my friends went to, they either went to Stanford University or they went to an Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. So it was rebellious in my mind to go to UC Davis. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. gotcha. I guess that's a way of saying that. You know what I mean? I, I didn't really know all these people were into these college applications in a really kind of intense way. And I was ambivalent about the whole thing. Got it. And I didn't want to be caught up in that. Part of it, I think, was self-defense and protection from the anxiety of all that. Yeah. But I remember thinking, like, if I can just go to a college that has a good library, I can get what I need, you know? <laughs> but I was applying to school and I saw Wayne Tebow's name listed on the art department faculty. I was just looking at the art department faculty of every school that I could find and uh -huh. what felt like a place that I might be able to go. I, I had no real interest in going to the East Coast. I'm very California boy. And especially at that age, I didn't want to go that far away. And yeah, I don't love the cold. And <laughs> <laughs> so I saw Tebow's name on that art department faculty. And number one, I didn't know he was like still alive, you know, because... <laughs> When you're 18, you know, 70 sounds like a million. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God. And number two, I couldn't believe he was still teaching. You know, he was a legend. Yeah. Of the Bay Area art world when I was a kid. And I had his poster on my wall. You know, I thought, God, he's teaching <laughs> just two hours away, you know. And that was the only reason really I even looked at the school. And then I liked how it felt when I went there. And it, I was very lucky. Like you say, I was very lucky. There were these just great teachers there. It was, I didn't know that it was such a good art department historically. It was just almost chance. I saw Tebow's name and I checked it out and I liked it. Right. <laughs> <It's> that. <laughs> right. And then they had these really great teachers. And to the point that you started this thing with, at the moment of graduating, when I got my, you know, master's of fine art, uh -huh. one of the teachers, Annabeth Rosen, she said, well, congratulations. You know that now you really become a student. And it wasn't a new concept. I mean, it was like, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that 
that process of learning or whatever, that never stops the way I think about it. Yeah. I think I graduated and thought like, okay, at this point, I should know everything there is to know about uh-huh. art, <laughs> uh-huh. which is ridiculous. Oh, gosh. Yeah. What you learn is how much you you don't you know, know. The more you learn, the more you learn what there is to know and how much you don't know. And yeah. 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 So I think for me, there was like a period of torture where I was like, well, I, I should know that, but I don't. What happened? Yeah. So you asked about moments along that path. Yeah. I'll tell you a couple early ones and you can just cut me off when it goes too long. But so Wayne Tebow was teaching at UC Davis. But what I didn't realize until I was already enrolled in there is that you can't take his classes until you are upper division, which means you have to be a junior. Mm -hmm. So here I get to the school and I'm all gung ho, ready to go freshman and I'm ready to go. And I realize the whole reason I came here, I cannot even do for two years. Right. So I didn't I didn't know about the protocol or the technical aspects of this, but I just I just started going to his classes. <laughs> <laughs> you just showed up and <laughs> Yeah, I just showed up. I didn't announce myself. I didn't say can I audit this or whatever. And was it an actual painting studio? I'm assuming it was an actual painting studio class where you walk in and you're you've got your paints out and you're painting, or was it more of a lecture? It was a lecture. The a painting class would have been much harder to sneak in. To sneak in. Although at that time, I don't think they would have noticed anyway, you know. <laughs> but anyway, no, it was a class. The first class that he was teaching the fall that I got to Davis, he was teaching a class called Theory and Criticism, Art 148. And it was, it turns out, his signature class, which was, it was a lecture class, but he turned out to be like, he's very professorial, you know, he's very academic and intellectual. And he just would stand in front of the class and kind of talk about whatever he wanted to talk about for a couple hours a week. And it was, I mean, it's hard not to get all hyperbolic about it, but it he opened up whole worlds to me every week. Right. Because I was, you know, I was a naive 18 year old. Right. And he had kind of the whole history of the 20th century in almost firsthand experience, you know? Yeah. So all the artists he was talking about, at least the 20th century ones, he knew them (laughs) personally. Right. And he was quoting them, not from a book, but just from being with them. And it was just amazing. And I sat there and I took notes like a good student. And I ended up sitting in on that class probably four or five times. The same class four or five times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the whole semester, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think twice was officially enrolled. Right. What were some of your biggest takeaways from that class? What are some of the, you know, are there, is there anything that sticks with you that you were kind of like, whoa, I never thought of that or wow, that really just blew my mind. Oh, so many things. A short way of saying it was he, he taught us how to see. And it wasn't even a studio class so that it's, you know, we say that a lot and we're in a drawing class, you know, Mm -hmm. we're talking about we're learning to see and we're translating the world and blah, blah, blah. But in a sort of bigger, even conceptual way, he was really through the course of the semester showing us how to look at painting and the world in a way that was rigorous, where we held ourselves responsible for our share in participating and doing our homework and knowing what we were looking at and why mm. and what pictures are made of and why people make them. And he really just gave a whole worldview of how to be a student of the world and a student of painting. And he's very humble and sincere in his approach to that. Like he was this famous faculty, but he was maybe the least arrogant in a way Mm -hmm. in his approach to things. He was completely trying to come at it from a really beginner's mind every time, you know? (sighs) So that was a big one, you know, but he would also do, it was also like his sense of humor and you can see the sense of humor in his work, but it was really great to be in his class and see him and, and have that firsthand. Everything was kind of a, a wink, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes at the end of class, he would say, okay, does anyone have any questions? And I would raise my hand every time. And he called on me one time. I said, what's your favorite song? Oh, God. Because <laughs> I'm really into music. And I right. thought, like, I'm going to learn something about him by knowing what's his favorite song. 
All right. Sorry. I reacted that way because I've heard him speak and I've heard somebody ask him, what's your favorite ex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're 18. You just want to. You want to ask something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he said, without missing a beat, he said, your feet's too big by Fats Waller. I want it played at my funeral. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I was in love, you know, it's like, oh, boy. I don't know who Fats Waller is, but I'm going to go find that song right now. Exactly. (laughs) That's so funny. The other thing was that he would come to class in a suit and bow tie, which, you know, for listeners who are not familiar with art departments is not the standard dress for art teachers. Right. (laughs) And at one end of one class, I said, is that a real bow tie or is it a clip on? (laughs) The hubris. Right. And I bet he loved it. Oh, he loved it. And he gave me an answer without speaking. He untied it and then retied it (laughs) and said, next question. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) I actually, you know, very, very indirectly, this podcast has like a thread through Wayne Tebow, which is Mm -hmm. a good friend of mine. His grandfather was Morgan Flagg. And Morgan Flagg collected Wayne Tebow's work early, early on and sort of championed him and a lot of the Bay Area painters. Mm -hmm. Um, So this friend of mine would describe, you know, before I ever met his grandfather, he would talk about going to visit his grandfather and waking up in the guest bedroom and there's the gumball machine. Like you open your eyes and there it is. (laughs) And eventually later on, I, I was able to meet his grandfather and get sort of a tour of his house and all, you know, and there's like napkins of you know, Wayne writing something and, you know, they had Mm -hmm. lunch together with a little sketch and a little signature or whatever. And just all these artists that I studied in school and my mouth is on the ground and I don't even know what to say. I'm just like so completely overwhelmed by being in this place and the history of it. And just like, you know, all these, in my eyes, these gods of art, right? seeing stuff that you'll never, ever be able to see any other way. Yeah, And I was so sort of intimidated by it that I really didn't ask him very many questions. I was just like eyes mm-hmm. like as like saucers and following him around. And then I got invited back to their house and I stayed there for the weekend. And it was the same thing where I was just like, oh, my gosh. And like a year or two later, he passed away. And I realized like all of those stories, mm-hmm. all of those lunches, all of those like anecdotes that nobody will ever know about. There has Mm -hmm. to be, you know, and that just sort of planted the seed. And it was like years later that I finally actually acted on it and started doing the podcast. Mm -hmm. That's great. I love that story. That's great. Yeah. So it's really, I just love hearing all this, you know. He had a big influence. It's appropriate that he would be one of the reasons for something like this because he had such a great far reaching influence on so many young painters and, you know, he's almost like an ambassador for painting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So once you graduated from Davis, can you describe a little bit about what you what you did? Like some people immediately try to get into galleries. Some people, you know, like what was your pathway once you got out of there? What did you like (laughs) when you finally got kicked out of the nest? What happened? Yeah. And I was in that nest a long time because I did undergraduate and graduate all in a row which is rare, but I just saw that Deborah Butterfield, do you know Deborah Butterfield? No. Artist that does, she uses all kinds of materials, but she always turns them into horses. Like if you see a public art piece somewhere in California where there's like twisted metal or wood or something, and then it all looks like a horse. So anyway, she went to Davis and she, I saw that she did that too. She did undergrad and graduate in a row, but so that's six years. So by the time I was getting out of there, I wanted to get way out of there. (laughs) So I moved to New York like a month after graduating. Why did you choose New York? Is it the obvious art reasons? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just what you did, I guess. You know, it's like, go to New York. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) If you want to paint and you want to be air quote serious about art, you go to New York and get into the galleries there. Yeah, that's right. And I was very intimidated by New York. But my what became my girlfriend at the time and now my wife, she was going to move there. And that gave me just enough <laughs> gumption yeah. to go, OK, I'm going to leave California. We still know one person and that and we can do it together, you know. So endless credit to her, because I don't know that I would have had that 
fearlessness to go do that without her. Yeah. Yeah. And but yeah, it was just the normal, you know, what did you expect would happen when you do you remember like what you were thinking and like, okay, we're gonna go to New York together. And here's my vision of what's gonna happen. Oh, God, my vision was so, you know, my vision of New York was based on movies. And especially the art world, it was like all 50s, 60s, (laughs) 70s, it may be into the 80s, but what I realized was probably the early 80s. So by the time I got there, it was the summer of 2000. Uh huh. It was not at all like I imagined. <laughs> <laughs> that New York was so long gone. And this is the this is the story that illustrates that. So the very night that I fly into New York, I went and had dinner with a friend in the I think in the West Village, and she took me out to this restaurant. And we're sitting in there and I'm looking around, you know, wide eyed and the restaurant looks really old. It's like this molded tin ceiling. And, Mm. you know, it felt like I was in Paris or something. It was old. And I said something about that to her. I said, oh, this is what I wanted in New York. It's like history and real. And she said, oh, this restaurant opened two years ago. It's a company that that specializes in making new things look old. (laughs) And it was a metaphor for the whole thing. You know, it was like I had some fantasy of this nostalgic New York. Right. And actually, it was like a kind of corporate stage set by the time I got there, you know. <laughs> and and New York was all Bubba Gumps and ESPN Zone. Right. TGI Fridays. Times Square. Yeah. Hard Rock Cafe. Oh, God. So I was really naive and I... I got over that pretty quickly. My idea of what it was going to be went away very fast. (laughs) (laughs) So what actually happened when you moved to New York? Well, I had a friend, someone recommended me to a guy that worked at the Guggenheim. And they said, okay, you can get a job there. You know, the question is, what are you going to do for money when you get to New York, right? Yeah. (laughs) And you're going to learn how much money you actually need. But first he said, okay, well, you got a guy here who will give you a job. And he's at the Guggenheim. So I show up there. And I have no idea what it is. And it's like art handling, basically. Okay. So I started working on these crews that were bringing in the art, taking, putting up the shows, installing the shows and museums and galleries. And then you sort of meet the people on those crews and they invite you to other museums. And so I was working at museums and galleries doing that, putting up shows, taking down shows. And that is how I started to meet people. And then... You know, New York is still really great for that kind of serendipitous, just meeting people and you're not tucked away in your car, you know? Right, right. You're out interacting with people. Yeah. And you get off work and they say, oh, we're going to go get a beer. And so then you take the subway and you go get a beer and you walk around and you really get to know people in a pretty short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then that was really great because they didn't care at all where I had gone to school or anything, you know? (laughs) (laughs) They're like, you got a graduate degree? Why? You know, (laughs) what's wrong with you? Why would you do that? Yeah. And I loved that that was not because I grew up, you know, next to Stanford University. It was like education was just a given as the most important thing, you know? Right. And it was really refreshing to get to New York. And they were just they were just making stuff and they did not care where you went to school or what, you know, just show me what you make. What do you do? Did that change how you looked at your own practice? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It just made me focus on that in a different way, I guess. I was already focused on that, but it was a different way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember remember leaving work one day and one of my friends that worked there, he was leaving work early and he said, you know, my work comes first. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I guess it does, doesn't it? It should. And that never left me. You know, it's like, oh, that the painting for me, painting for him. That was a guy who did all kinds of crazy stuff, bear costume performances. And, <laughs> but that came first for him, you know, and so mm-hmm. that seriousness, it was it was really a kind of seriousness, even though it was different. It was non-academic, but it was just as serious. Yeah, I really liked that about it. I got a lot of respect for the artists in New York that were not faint. They're people that you wouldn't see on the museum circuit. But they're working artists and they care just as much and work just as hard as everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I keep hearing about. Like, I think I feel like I'm not sure if this is true or not, but 
the vibe for lack of a bit, but that sounds so LA, the vibe in yeah. New York, that it's it's not what you do when you have time. It's the first thing that you do and everything else fits in around it mm-hmm. at all costs, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And I think that there's a very different sort of outlook on that, that it's kind of like, when everything is good, then I'll be able to focus on my art. Right. Right. And that day may never come because <laughs> it's <Exactly>. like, <laughs> or, or you might wait, you know, you might wait 40 years before it does. I don't know. Yeah. But it's such a, a subtle, but extremely important difference. Yeah. And I had been exposed to it before. Another great experience at UC Davis was a New York artist that came and was a visiting teacher. And I took his class. Uh huh. His name was Tim Rollins. He was the first working famous New York artist I ever met. And he was really the opposite of the people I knew in California. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember sitting at the desk one day and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm thinking. He said, don't think, draw. Yeah. And that changed my thinking. You know, it's like, oh, that's right. Drawing is thinking. Draw, like think physically, make something, work through the idea. Don't just sit and ponder the idea. Right. And he said a lot of things like that. He was scary to someone like me who had grown up in kind of airy fairy Northern California. This guy was a real kick in the seat of the pants. And then you go to New York and everyone's like that. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. Yeah, that's the thing that you, that sort of strikes me about it is you grew up in Stanford where you're surrounded by all these academics and stereotypically, and I know I'm being stereotypical, but I grew up in Claremont, which is also a university mm-hmm. town a, yeah. or a college town. And so it's highly, highly intellectual, highly, you know, really brilliant people, but also, and I have a tendency to do this as well, thinking way too much. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Like at some point you have to stop thinking and just start, like you said, draw, not, you know. Yeah, that's right. To really act on it and to create something as opposed to imagine it. Yeah. And I think the thing that won me over, because I did my initial reaction to that that directive he gave was that it sort of sounded anti-intellectual and that bothered me, you know, coming from the Bay area, like, uh Oh, what's this? Are we just painting monkeys now? Yeah. I don't trust this. This isn't, this isn't real. Yeah. And then I realized what he meant was that drawing was a kind of thinking. And if the goal is that you're going to make some artwork here, you're going to make a painting in that case, all the thinking in the world's not going to paint the painting for you. So you better start making something that you can see. And it was, and he, he turned on that empirical process idea for me and encouraged it. And he was great. He was not a, he was not like an academic at all, you know, but he was a really great teacher. And that spirit was in New York for sure. It was really, it was like, you get up and go after it. Yeah. They can take themselves a little too seriously, too, as any sort of it's a provincial place, just like anywhere. You know, New York is a small town. <sighs> it's kind of hard to think of it that way, but it is 11 square miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the thinking, too, is very like tribe thinking. You know, New Yorkers are this way and you know, yeah. L.A. people are this way. And it, both stereotypes are kind of true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> totally. <laughs> So it was really invaluable. I was only there for a couple years because we just sort of ran out of money. And then, oh, long story, but September 11th happened. And that dried up the funding for the places where I was making my, paying my bills through all these museums and galleries. And that Uh. stuff shut down for the first part of 2002. And I just, we couldn't weather the storm, you know, financially. We didn't have deep enough roots or anywhere to land. So we had to head back. Right, right. Yeah, I think that was a really pivotal. Yeah. That seems like an understatement. But yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, mean, well, I yeah. mean, I guess what I mean by that is that um, I've talked to a couple artists who left New York at that time, because for very similar reasons, you just couldn't yeah. be there anymore. It was not sustainable until it was rebuilt. A lot of people were doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a common thing. You'll. It, it was like during the 2000s, it was everyone in New York. In fact, when I was there, I'm sure it's still the same. A lot of the conversations among New York artists was where else are we going to (laughs) go? Oh, wow. Yeah. And a lot of people went like the musician friends I had there moved to Europe. 
where there's a little more of a market and sort of financial support for musicians, live music scene, you know, mm-hmm. people move to Berlin or Berlin was huge. I, I haven't heard of, I haven't followed it, I should say, but there was a certain point where, you know, it's that again, talking stereotypes, but there's always these areas that are sort of underdeveloped or they're going through a big transition and nobody really wants to move there. So the artists all come in because you have these That's right. massive, cheap workspaces. That's it. And then they make <laughs> it cool because we're so cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the rest of the world follows. And then we get kicked out again and we have to go, we're like, we're nomads. Yeah, that's very much true. Yes. And I guess it sort of just comes with the territory. It's like the artist's life path is going to, you're probably going to need to move a few times and it's going to be. <sighs> yeah. And appropriate to what you're saying, the next place I was spending a lot of time was downtown Los Angeles. Oh, right. The financial district. Yep. And when I was there, it was still what they called Skid Row. Yep. And by the time we got sort of kicked out of there, they started charging real rents, you know, then it was movie stars living there and people walking pugs down the street. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, the thing that killed me about watching that, because I was still sort of in the LA area when that started and what killed Mm -hmm. me about it is they would build these they would renovate these huge buildings and make it look like the brewery yes you know make it look like like, kind of like what you said about new york like they would take these buildings and try to make it look like these like your fantasy version of an artist's loft yes and then they would rent them out for like ten thousand dollars a month or something just like ridiculous (laughs) insane and then the whole neighborhood would just be filled with pugs it's true. And they market it as artists. artists. Loft. This is the, what do they call it now? The arts district. Yes. Right? Yes. And none of the artists can afford to live there no. anymore. Because they <laughs> you can barely afford to have lunch there now. It seems to be an effective marketing. Yeah, they keep doing it. Yeah. And all the best things about it, like all the little taco trucks and all the like, you know, the $3 meals that you could like just chow down on, gone. Totally gone. Yeah. 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 Makes me want to cry. Yeah. Well... It's just, you know, we're kind of the artists are the pawns in the games and it was great while it lasted. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And there's other places. There's always other places. I mean, maybe we'll take over Detroit next. Who knows? I know. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. People have those conversations all the time. (laughs) So I'm curious. I love asking this question. I always feel like I have to give people like a forewarning when I ask this. The reason why I ask this question is because I think it's so helpful for artists to hear about sort of the setbacks and the challenges, the things that really didn't go so well, but Mm -hmm. most importantly, what your takeaway was from that experience. So I would love for you to share a story if you have one. Um, It can either be something like you had to sort of mentally get over or, you know, an actual thing that happened. I think that this is probably a common story. I don't know. You've probably heard versions of this before, but An obvious one that comes to mind is the financial meltdown, Great Recession, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. That could be a very long story, too. But to try to get to the point of it, in 2007, 8, 9, I was renting a big studio in Signal Hill area of Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And things were going pretty well in terms of selling paintings and starting to work with more galleries and better galleries. And I felt really optimistic and things were on the upswing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I remember hearing little rumblings of stock market and blah, blah, blah. And I started getting emails from people who had bought paintings who were looking to resell them and stuff, you know? (laughs) And I didn't know what was coming, obviously. But by the time that really hit end of 2008, it was really it was bad timing for me because I had sort of went all in with my chips and was renting this big studio and I had stopped teaching. And right. I made the same mood move in 2007 where I put all the chips in. It was just bad timing. Yes. So it was one of those. And eventually the bottom just all fell out of that. And We actually moved. By that time, my wife had gotten her PhD. She had finished her PhD in a different field. And she's she likes her privacy, so I won't go into much of it. I won't ask. (laughs) But um, so she had gotten her 
PhD in a different field and her first job that she was offered was at Penn State. And she knew, I remember at the time she was going like, I don't think we should do that because I know that you're going to want to be around here for your career and stuff. And I'm, and I'm looking at the financial news and everything and just thinking, oh boy, I don't know if I can, I don't know if we can count on that. Right. And we had just had our daughter in 2007. So it was all just bad timing. And she got that offer and I said, you know, let's do that. I think we have to do that. That's the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we went to Pennsylvania, which for me was nowhere, you know, right? (laughs) No offense, no offense to people in Pennsylvania. But in my world, and in my experience, I knew nothing of the place, right? If there's even artists there, it was like an exile to me, (laughs) you know, but I chose it because I knew that it was the right thing to do. But it was that was very hard. So we went there and we ended up in like the Amish country of Pennsylvania. Wow. And at the time, I'll say that, like, in retrospect, I'm now very fond of that time period of our lives. Right. But at the time, it was really hard. And mostly just mentally, mostly just it was a really great opportunity to beat myself up about failing and, you know, why am I here and what am I doing and all of that, you know? Right. So it was a real... I call it the belly of the whale period, you know? So all the these external things that are completely out of your control, everybody's control, and hopefully it's a once in a lifetime thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yet you sort of kind of took it upon yourself as, you know, like I'm a failure. Like that's, that's yeah. how you were feeling at the time about <laughs> it, that this is all. <laughs> but so now in retrospect, what were you kind of doing while you were there? Was it sort of like, I'm just kind of imagining like, maybe my overly optimistic self, but in retrospect, was it sort of like a painting sabbatical? And did you like have like this, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. That is how it is in my, in retrospect. Right. But at the time it was torture. At times it was torture. At times it was really great. I mean, it snowed in New York, obviously, but snow is different in a city like that. It gets really nasty, really fast. The first time that it snowed in Pennsylvania, I almost started crying. It was so beautiful and so quiet and everything stopped, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot about that experience that was actually, I think, really necessary for us. It was the anti Los Angeles. It was the um, antidote maybe to the stress and traffic and everything. Mm. And it was really the opposite in every way for good and bad. I lost a lot of weight because I didn't like the food, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So we just went down to this Amish farmer's market and just would buy fresh vegetables and cook them at home. And that's pretty much what I ate. And my mental health regimen was that I was exercising a lot to kind of keep myself from tanking. Yeah. Well, I was playing a lot of basketball. I I grew up as a, I played a lot of basketball growing up and Uh, I got back into it kind of heavy there just as a way to keep my sanity. That was my antidepressant, you know, was to just go sweat it out for a couple hours a day. It was great. Mm -hmm. And then I would come back home and people would be frightened, you know, gosh, you look like you're gaunt. (laughs) (laughs) But more seriously, it was a really great period of kind of quiet introspection where we lived. I could almost walk everywhere that I needed to go unless we went somewhere on the weekend, which was like almost always Philadelphia Museum. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's really funny. For the first few years of her life, my daughter thought that Philadelphia the word Philadelphia meant the Philadelphia Museum. (laughs) (laughs) Because every time we said we're going to Philadelphia, it was always to that museum first. Wow. So there were really great things. And I had a cheap studio space that was in this, this photographer, really nice guy owned this big brick, three story, long kind of shotgun style building with hardwood floors. Oh, wow brick walls. And it was so cheap compared to California and New York. And the daylight was different. As you know, on the East Coast, it's very different light. And I eventually totally fell in love with that studio. And it was very quiet. And I think what I took away from it was, it was a real kind of gut check on like, how committed are you to this, you know? So I just had to prove to myself every day that I was willing to 
do whatever it had to do Mm -hmm. and trudge through the snow to get to the studio that was 30 degrees when I got there. And even if it's midnight and I was teaching at a school that was local there, which was actually a really great school. And I met great people and I loved being in a different, you know, it's kind of a different culture. For example, in Los Angeles, so much is centered around the movie industry and the arts tend toward that, like illustration and animation and even the fine arts kind of nudge that way, I Mm. think, because of that. Mm -hmm. And then in Philadelphia, or I was outside of Philadelphia, but in Pennsylvania, I think everything was kind of influenced by the art that was nearby, the Barnes Foundation and the Philadelphia Museum. So everyone at this school was painting like Cezanne. Right. And it was really interesting and healthy for me to be just plopped into this totally different context and adjust to that. Yeah. So it was really good. It was and it was a real it was we were there for three years and I was afforded a lot more kind of quiet contemplation and painting and sort of silence and walking everywhere and slowing down. And it was really good for me. It was very hard at the time, but I wouldn't trade it. I would do it again. Absolutely. Yeah. As hard as it, I wouldn't trade it. And I kind of proved something to myself, I think, by going through that and just keeping going, you know? Right. And amazing things happened. You know, I learned if you just keep going, if you just kind of don't blink and just keep showing up, to the studio and keep painting. I learned that good things happen and you never know what's going to happen next. And that first year there, I thought I was sort of falling off a cliff and I'd never have another show again. And I'd never, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The whole thing's going to fall apart. Everything's going to go wrong and it's going to blow up. And this is a total disaster. Yep. Yes. And I I felt very, it was kind of culture shock and I was out of place and what am I doing here and all that Mm -hmm. that one can do when they move, a big move like that. And then I just kept going. I just kept walking to the studio and painting and putting in my time and reading and going to the museums and continuing in good faith and trying to not give in to the dramatic (laughs) thoughts in my head. The disaster scenarios. Yeah, Yeah, right. Uh huh. And then all of a sudden things would happen, you know, a, a gallery would call me up and say, hey, do you want to do a show? And great things happened. You know, I had a museum show locally there and I started working with a woman who was opening a gallery down in Washington, D.C. And I started getting to spend time in those museums in D.C. And, you know, they're just they're just great places. And then I could that got me out of my head and I could really just try to be present and appreciate what I did have and what I was able to do and see. And right. So you get to that moment of thinking, you think you've lost everything. You think you're giving up. And if you just don't, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I just, I just thought, well, I have no idea what else to do. There's nothing else I want to do with my life, you know? Right. Right. And you just go, okay, well, I guess I'll go back to the studio. And then as you're painting that questioning process, kicks in again. And you go, well, what is this thing? Why do I want to keep coming back to the studio? You know, right? what about painting that would make me such an irrational human being, you know? Yeah. And be willing to, you know, all these sacrifices and all these discomforts and everything. What is it? And really try to get back in touch with it. Yeah. And for a long time in Pennsylvania, I was sitting, I was painting, sitting in a chair on small paintings, holding them in my hands. And I was trying to reconnect with being like a kid in elementary school drawing in a notebook, you know, like yeah, cartoons and all that stuff. And the, all the things like when you first fell in love with it, what was it? Yeah. And really try to reconnect with the just the joy and the pleasure and the ridiculousness of it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so true. You have to we are, we're all kind of crazy, you know, <laughs> there's truth to that stereotype of the, of the crazy artist. And, and you have to be a little bit irrational to go into this and to stay in it. I think that it is very common for people to kind of get spooked and go find something that's more stable or yeah. what often happens is, you know, you start a family and this intense responsibility yeah. lands on your shoulders and it's not as easy to say, okay, I'm just going to paint 
Yeah, no, it gets way more serious when there's a family around you <laughs> yeah. looking at you going like, okay, <laughs> what are you going to do? We need food. We need, to pay these we bills. need... <laughs> we need food. Yeah. yeah. Electricity, it all those real. fun things. Yeah, it gets, it gets real. And yeah, and so there is that certain amount of kind of irrational, stubborn, I don't know what else you want to add to that descriptions yeah. that w- that we have to have in order to to keep going in this, but bullheadedness. Yeah. I'm a Taurus. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say, I will admit, I kind of feed off of that feeling. There's something about the craziness of that that it energizes me. Mm-hmm. Not every day. There are days of fear, but a lot of times it's like I loved the feeling of knowing that it was kind of nuts, but it was also true. Like it was also, it is really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to put in the work and somehow make it work. And I kind of feed off of that eventually. Right. You know, there was a moment to go back to Tebow and Davis. There was a moment once when I was his teaching assistant and I mustered up the courage. I was intimidated by him too especially when I was younger like that, I mustered up the courage to ask him about career stuff. And he never wanted to talk about that. He was always focused on painting in a very kind of idealistic, theoretical, purist way. Mm -hmm. One day I mustered up the courage to talk to him about galleries and career and how do you do that? And he was really quiet. He didn't say anything for a minute, which felt like, you know, a half an hour. Right. And then he said... A lot of people stop painting around 45 and then he paused and he goes, some of them make it to 50, but a lot of people stop sometime around then. And I forget what he said after that because it was so not what I was expecting him to say. And I was scrambling in my brain trying to understand, did he not hear my question? You know, (laughs) is this guy senile? And then going, oh, I see. (laughs) It was this incredible sort of, you know, martial arts wave off of Uh my question. The wax on, wax off. Listen to me, young grasshopper. This is not about that. This is about a lifetime of really being engaged with the pursuit of painting and really caring about it. And all those other things that you think are important about galleries and career and blah, 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 you know. That's not the thing. That's not the game. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Pennsylvania, Tebow and I got even closer. And part of it, I think, is that his son died during that time, his son, Paul. And he didn't talk much about it. Wayne is a very, in a certain kind of way, he's sort of reserved and private person. It's just how he is. And maybe the time period and, you know, how he was raised, he's just like that. But he did kind of, I feel like, open up in a different way. And when I would go visit him during that time period, we got a lot closer and he was kind of more actively trying to help me out and encourage me. And he really helped me get through that too. He's a great, he's just a great guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he cares about his students. He knows if someone's having a hard time, he'll call them up and encourage them and whatever I can do to help you. (laughs) (laughs) That voice. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. We all joke about the former Tebow student. I'll joke about his voice because it's impossible not to do it. My wife always says, how come you have to do it in the voice? <laughs> in the voice. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's so great. It's so beautiful, too. I just I love that story. And I don't know if it, you know, is this a Taurus thing or what? But when you just told me that story, all I was thinking was, okay, so then the trick is the trick. Because we're always looking for the trick. Yeah. What's the answer? Keep going. That's it. You're going to want to quit. Okay. All right. I'm going to want to quit soon. I'm in that range. I'm in that age range. So apparently I'm going to want to quit soon. So it might come. And if it does, just keep pushing. (laughs) 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 Ignore it. (laughs) That's right. This was the great benefit of he was in his 70s, like I said, when I was actively studying with him. Mm -hmm. And so he had a whole lifetime of perspective. Yeah. And he wasn't the only one. There were other teachers that were really great. But that was a common theme 
they never really explained how to make a living or what to do for money. That generation of teachers would never, right. <laughs> never deign to address it. Right. But they did acknowledge how hard it was and how much the odds were against anybody doing it. Right. Right. And so I was prepared for it mentally, but it is the game. I think that's the game. The game is longevity and knowing that there's a difference between all the things that we call career and making a life as a painter, you know, right, that they are two different things. And ideally, the career facilitates your life as a painter, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is why I think so many people teach because it keeps yes. them, you know, the thing that they do to make money is also feeding into their work. Yes. And it grounds you in as difficult as teaching can be and as tiring as it can be. It's an authentic interaction. Mm -hmm. You have some students who want to learn about painting and you talk to them about painting and paint with them and all that stuff that goes on. Right. It's a real interaction. Right. It's honest. It's meaningful. It's personal. And in the art world, so much of what happens is sort of not quite that real or authentic. You know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and money people and sharks, you know, and all the stuff that goes on. <laughs> it's hard to tell. It's like a strange circus. I think that, that that microcosm exists in almost any industry. It's just that God, there's something about, you know, because we'll do this regardless. Yeah. You know, we will find a way to do it. And so right. it's really easy to take advantage of artists for that reason, because yeah. they're not going to give up. They're going to keep doing it. It's not like you're a banker that's like, okay, I need my weekly paycheck. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. It's not an option. A lot of us, I will, I will cop to this. A lot of us are not great business people. Mm -hmm. It's just not naturally how I'm sort of wired. Well, I think it's more that, I mean, I don't know, like my perspective on it, at least, is being a painter, being a good painter is so time consuming and there's no end to it and there's no end to the learning and there's no end to your curiosity and your fascination. So we just won't take the time to learn how to be a good business person. It's because be I think it. It, I think it's, I don't think we're not capable of it. Yeah, sure. I think it's that we we refuse to invest the time in it. I think you're right. But either way, <laughs> it becomes <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. One way or the other, it becomes a situation where artists can be taken advantage of Easily. and can feel kind of alienated in that whole business, you know? Yeah. And the real game is to keep painting and loving painting and not just as a way to kind of make product or be a kind of, here's another Tebow thing. He would often quote de Kooning, who he was friends with. And he would say that de Kooning often would say, one thing to avoid is becoming an art world employee. And it's a romantic notion, but A, I'm a romantic and B, it's almost like you have to be to make a life as a painter. It's a romantic idea in the first place. <laughs> True. So that idea of independence and to try to be somehow eke out a life on your own terms and make your own work and not just be overly influenced by the fashion of the moment or the business of it or all the distractions that can come up, but to really try to keep it on a personal interaction with painting and what you love about it and what you want to do and how to, yeah. how to pursue it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that our current society, at least for the past hundred or so years is almost entirely based on the factory model. Mm -hmm. The education system, everything is sort of geared towards churning out good workers who follow the rules, <laughs> do what they're supposed to do. And follow this program. And these are the results that you get. Yeah. Turn this widget, turn that widget, and you come up with this product. And so in order to, to do what we do, we have to be the opposite of that, which yeah. is so hard. And it can be so exhausting, because I think that's where we start to feel like we're crazy, because we're going in the exact opposite direction as the rest of the world, convinced that we're right, <laughs> praying that we're doing the right thing. 
Mm-hmm. And we just have to have that faith and that belief in ourselves to keep doing it, which is, yeah, you know, like that's fine for a couple of years, but, you know, and I think that's where that 40 to 45 year old thing that Wayne mentioned comes in is after 20, 30 years of it, you might start second guessing your decisions, you know, yeah. like you might not be able to persist knowing that it will turn out. I think it's a big reason for the importance of community Mm. and why artists and and painters tend to, it's usually kind of a small circle, but we, we need it. We need a little group Mm -hmm. of friends and sort of fellow travelers, you know? Yeah. And I think the podcast thing and the, you know, there are, there are negative aspects to the kind of online world as it relates to painting, but as it helps people find a community and hear other artists talk and stuff, that's a really good thing. Yeah. I think we have more ways of finding each other now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we need each other. We need each other. Cause like you said, the culture is very much, we're pushing against an ocean sometimes, yeah. right? <laughs> Definitely. Tilting at windmills. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I feel like we're we're our own little Don Quixotes in some regards. <laughs> we're just like, okay, I'm seeing this. I hope you see it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Vaughn, thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. This has been very, I don't know what to say. Like, it's kind of like part of me is just kind of like hearing Wayne Tebow's stories. Of course, I'm just going to be like, wide-eyed and all that. But I think that the observations that she, that you've made and the experiences that you've had are really going to, other people hearing that is really going to help. Well, I hope so. For those of us who can't help but do it, it's important for us to encourage each other and be there for each other too. Mm-hmm. Create that. I mean, we make it up, you know, we make it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in our hands what painting is. We're making it now. And all those great paintings of history are still there and they are present, but we have to carry it. We have to carry it forward and can't do it alone. No. Yeah. It was really nice to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Me too. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast with Vaughn Sumner. To see examples of Vaughn's work and to get links to any of the artists and resources that we mentioned, just go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. If you are in Southern California, you can see an exhibition of Vaughn's paintings at KP Projects on La Brea in Los Angeles or a show that he curated called The Trash Can School at Basement Projects in Santa Ana. Both shows run through February 2018. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in large part by listeners like you. So if you'd like to help out, it's really quick and easy, and it is a huge, huge help to the show. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash support to donate. And with that, I have some very, very special people to thank. A big, big thank you to Jennifer Small, Margaret Cutter, Janet Vanderhoof, William Vabdussin, Julian Davis, Giselle Gautreau, Tina McCoy, La Serena Laguna, Carla Roth, Michael Weiss, Shelley McQuaid, Virgil Dyson, Nigel Sutherland, Simon J. Ford, Sarah Sedwick, Gregory Spear, Stephanie Neely, Susan Zepting Kuhn, Margaret Serena, Karen O'Connell, and Srivani Nara. You help make these podcast episodes possible, and I am extremely grateful for your support. Thank you so much. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. 
Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.